Hello, writers and crafters. I'm Valerie Eason. And I'm Eric Mertz. And it is November 30th, 2022, as we record this. Our main topic is failure. Oh, boy. <laughs> More specifically, failing <laughs> in order to succeed. Uh, we don't have any new patrons this week, but a big squeezy hug and thank you to our existing patrons for believing in us and in the podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash Valerie Isan, I-H-S-A-N, for a gander at all the tiers and cool benefits. We had a comment last week um, for last week's episode 92. Uh, Mary says, very nice episode. I'm excited for both of you and your upcoming projects. Um, she said, Valerie, I think the picture on your author website is fantastic. I definitely think that picture of you would entice people to pick up the book. I'm not sure which one she's talking about because I have a lot of pictures on the website, but Thank you. Take it though. Take it. Yeah. That's thank you. And Mary. then and then Eric, I have your first book. I like the cover and I look forward to reading it. So again, oh I don't know which book that is. Is that zero <laughs> or is that one? But I don't know. Thank you either way. Right? And I hope you enjoy it. I guess I really loved writing it. Okay, so the next announcement um, is a reminder of the Writer Craft Writing Retreat and Workshop. The tickets are live, priced at nine hundred, but patrons um, get a discount to eight hundred twenty-five. Monthly payments are an option, and it's scheduled for next August twenty-fourth uh, to the twenty-seventh. Tickets include all the lodging, all the gourmet meals, plus instruction and coaching and retreat time on the river in Marcola, Oregon. So you can go to ValerieEason.com slash retreat for more information. Are you going to go to that? <laughs> I am. Travel is a negotiation in this household. I am crossing right? my fingers. I, I get, I, I get uh, August. There's a wedding next year. There's a two trips next year and I'm potentially a, a trip to Italy. Oh, yay. Yeah, we have a, yeah. a trip to Turkey next year, um, you know, because we need to see Ali's mom as often as possible. And um, there might be a little detour to Greece for like three days also. That would be really nice. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> it's one of the it's islands right there. that you can ferry over to. And so that might be happening. And Ali and I had discussed um, not doing any reunions and stuff next year as we have several, um, not events, but like regular things that happen, you know, on a yearly right. base with friends and family. And, um, and we talked about, you know, maybe not doing that in 2023, just to save money and pay off debt and stuff like that. But, um, and so, yes, there's, a reunion in October that I really would like to go to, but with all my editor pals, but yeah, that's probably not going to happen either. <laughs> so yeah, I hear you. <laughs> I, yeah. My mom just went to France this year and she traveled. It's her first time traveling abroad since my father passed away. And she traveled with, uh, a, she works at a bookstore. It was mm -hmm. one of her bookstore pals. And she kept hinting throughout the preparation and the you know, and then the aftermath, like, wow, I'd really love to go to Italy. I'd love to go to Italy with someone like I really knew better than just a bookstore friend and someone who's <laughs> been like, to Italy. Yeah, she keeps, <laughs> she keeps like nudging, like, you uh -huh. know, hey, son, let's, let's do this. Uh, so that's, that's on the, that's on the top of my brain. Um, but nice. yeah, we're talking about how to make travel work because we have, yeah, like weddings and things, but mm -hmm. I want to do this. I love that part of the, I love that part of the state too. Oh, Marcola. Oh, anywhere in that. Mm -hmm. Just On that, that highway. Lush. Yeah. Oh man. So beautiful. So Eric, before we hit record, I reminded you that next oh, week, right. December 7th, I exactly. A day that will live in infamy. <laughs> Pearl Harbor Day. You right? joined the podcast. So I this did. is one next year. week will be your one year anniversary on the podcast. And I was super excited to notice that yesterday when I was looking through my planner and I just got all warm and fuzzy and, <laughs> and I was reminded I'll, I'll of getting save the... the slobbering for next week. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. you were telling me the a cake cool will story. arrive. <laughs> Hopefully the cake will arrive before the podcast so we can cut it on air. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember I was telling you, I remember getting the text, the text when you, when you put this up, I was at a, basketball game with a friend walking the concourse and you know 
I stopped to read the text and he kept talking and kept walking. And so it was like a very memorable moment. And I think you kind of, I remember you, your text was like, well, here, let me pitch this to you. And I thought like, you don't have to pitch it. I'm in, like, I'm, <laughs> I want, I want to do this with you. Let's go. Um, so I, yeah, fun. this was, this was, I couldn't think of anyone I'd want to work with on something like this than you. So thank it's you for so having fun. me. Yay. All right. Well, we'll talk more about that next week, December 7th. Um, yes. So I just finished reading Meredith Alone by Claire Alexander and The Music of Bees by Eileen Garvin. So, two books. Two books. Yeah. I finished those. You're awesome. <laughs> I have been reading a lot this year. And I think it's because, you know, the, the stress of not being able to read all the books that I want to read as I work in the bookstore and see all these books that I want to buy, <laughs> let alone read, made me set aside more time in my week to read. Um, it was important to me. And so I set aside one night a week that I don't watch TV and I read instead. And that... Mm goes you know sometimes there's more nights in there that I choose that instead of tv um I can't read at night before I go to bed anymore because I just fall asleep <laughs> so it has to be like early evening that I'm reading and of course I read at lunchtime but my breaks are usually small or like yesterday I just worked through lunch so I didn't read um right so yeah, I'm I finding missed... that I'm reading a lot more than I used to and getting through books. I didn't ever think I, you know, if I could read a book a month before, you know, several years ago, that was pretty standard, maybe, maybe one more, but uh, right. yeah, one or two a week. I miss the bus. I used cool. to, when I lived in Seattle, I used to commute to work by bus. I had, that was like an hour and 15 minutes of reading time. Mm -hmm. Um and working a standard job with those forced breaks, it's like, because I, I work through every lunch. I always put lunch on the schedule, mm -hmm. and you don't have to do this when you're when you're doing your thing. Like the next month, when you're doing your like when you're in your author business and you're doing it, some advice from me would be hold on to those lunch breaks because once you start working through one, you're working through all of them. <laughs> um, my wife has noticed. She said, like, you're not up here like hanging out and you know, watching YouTube videos and, you know, walking the dog anymore for lunch, are you? And I've kind of like, I'm a little embarrassed about that, that I don't take a lunch break like I used to. So that's one of my res work resolutions for next year. Mm. Um, spoiler alert, I am going to work. I am trying to get a lunch break back into my world. So nice. Yeah, I'm usually pretty great about allowing myself break times at home or stopping work in the afternoon. Um, especially if I work through the lunch <laughs> right. and, and I don't anticipate that changing much, but I'm on a couple of deadlines right now. So that's why I was, Yeah. and of course everything freaking takes so much longer than I think it is. So I'm going to like roll into my little author update here. <laughs> so I had um on my list of things to do yesterday, there were quite a few, like three, four or five, but they all seemed like smallish tasks. And even if, even if each one took a whole hour, I thought, okay, I could, I could reasonably get all this stuff done. Dude, right. I am so <laughs> not in my, like, there's no reality in my <laughs> stream of thinking these days. I don't know. <laughs> one of them took like four hours. So yeah, I got like, I did not get my list done. So that was part of why I was working through the lunch because... <sighs> When I'm on a deadline and things are taking four times longer at the minimum than I think they're going to. Yeah. I found so, that happens a lot when I say like, oh, I've got four one hour tasks on a Wednesday. I can get all those done in six hours. And then in, invariably the first one takes two and then the next one takes two and a half. One and of the I'm things I had to the line. redo. And so that slowed me down quite a bit. Um, arguably when you repeat a task it's faster because you've already done it you already know what you're looking for or, or you've already you know has that muscle memory or something like that but there's also that little bit of 
despair at like you already put an hour of work in and eat race so you have to start all over again. so that slows me down yeah. a little bit too like ah uh, I have yeah. um, I have the cover Familiar. picked out there's just I was kind of I'm I'm overthinking the um the subtitle font on the cover. I saw that in Slack the other day. <laughs> so yeah, that. I've been emailing back and forth with the designer. I totally am overthinking it, but it's 99% done. It's and and ready to approve the ebook cover. And there is one that I be I did I did tell the designer like, all right. I'm leaning towards this one, but I'm just not in love with the font. And what I had done was go to Canva and put my subtitle in like five or six different fonts that I preferred and just emailed that PDF over. It was like, hey, would any of this, look? I mean, I know she's the designer, so she'll be able right. to say like, oh no, like those two fonts don't go together or that looks stupid or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so I trust her to do that. I just didn't like the font that, she it just looked too much like a typewriter and I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> I think the typewriter font is unfortunately like a writer default. So if you can get away from that typewritery font, right. you're doing yourself a favor, but I don't think you can overthink those things. Honestly, I think if you're going to look at that book cover, hopefully for the next 10 to 15 years as an author, you, if you have that little niggling doubt about an element of it, it's not, I don't think it's going to go away. I think you are better just to get it right now than and and overthink it now then maybe although the feedback i was getting from the community was that the subtitle font would not make or break the decision to purchase the book you know no, <laughs> so no i don't think so that's... there's that so i forecasted my you. remaining publishing tasks and i am on target for the january release even though it seems to be <laughs> taking longer than i think I'm starting to think about pricing and keywords. That's kind of what I'm focusing on um, right now weird. or forecasted for next week anyways. Um, yesterday, I did the final proofread on the manuscript and I finalized the formatting and vellum. Um, and I, I'm going to send out the last batch of my postcards today. So if you still want a postcard and you haven't gotten one by next week, then you know email me, writer craftpodcast at gmail.com and let me know I somehow forgot you but I have a list of patrons so I should have should have sent one to everyone I had to go to the, the mail or to the post office to get postcard stamps so that's why it took me oh, a long yeah. time <laughs> they're always so uniquely different than regular stamps too right but they I don't know what they are cost anymore they used to be one penny one cent stamps for the postcards but now they just say forever on them so they don't have to keep redesigning yeah, everything's them. a forever stamp so i don't know so they, actually yeah. how much it cost yeah nobody knows what a stamp costs anymore uh what am i reading i just finished des i finished deserter this week um, which i was starting to read last week mm -hmm. uh, which is a japanese horror graphic novel definitely wacko just some crazy horror concepts a couple of them like made me really self-conscious to have the book like out on my living room table like I didn't want my <laughs> it was there was you don't want anyone to know I, that you I, read I, it <laughs> well I'm not I don't think I'm making any cultural generalities that people know that other people haven't but there's just what is frightening to certain cultures is it's not universal right right and I think when you read Japanese horror or watch Japanese horror it's a very just a very different scare mm -hmm. and for me, it's like, it's just very, dis it's just a disturbing read. It's like some of the, the stories in this thing were like, I, I had to put it down and just like, uh, you know, just, just like got under my skin. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got done with that, I picked up uh, Mexican Gothic. Oh, and, have you got very far yeah, into it? No, nah, I'm just a couple of chapters in. Um, it's a little slow which, start. A little slow start, but it's got that gothic novel start where it's like mm -hmm. you're setting up this whole like you know what once was and what is and this sort of you know that's the that's the basis of like every lovecraft story every every one of the and it just i like immediately as soon as i got two paragraphs in felt like okay i'm i'm home this is this is right yay um, i'm so glad i haven't read anything it's else by be her i have a a she doesn't um i heard her speak and so she said that her stuff doesn't fall under she doesn't write in one genre really right i mean you can put it under 
like mainstream fiction, but they have like Mexican Gothic was clearly like a Gothic story. And then Velvet Was the Night is a seventies noir. And yeah, so they are totally different really. (laughs) Yeah. But she likes to write that way. So it had such a, it had a great feel. It just, I was immediately transported to a place in a, in a, She's really so good at nice. the at the ambiance and the I can't wait for you to get to the to the castle. I don't think she calls it a I'm, castle, but you know. I'm gonna burn through this book too. Like I could just feel like it's just gonna be it's a fun and in it's a fun read already. So cool. And then author and- update. Boy, what am I doing? Um I'm rewriting a book. <laughs> it's it's not the most romantic part of being an author, but I am going through I so what I did was just a sort of a process layout briefly. Like I wrote the book as to be a novella. I was going to write a shorter book. I did like a real mythology dive and like, okay, what am I, what am I getting into? And I, I recognized that I couldn't, and what I wanted to reveal in my bigger story that I couldn't, I couldn't write to reveal just what I wanted to reveal in a novella. I had to reveal more because it just didn't make sense. It would have felt like a thinner, too thin, um, so I ended up taking like other concepts, what were, which were going to go into other books and then sort of put them into this. And so I've gone and sort of expanded the story, expanded the more like the outcomes of what happens in the story. And so I've basically gone through and what was a 15,000 word story, expanded it as I go. But what I what I really did was I I once I realized I wanted to do this, I had to rewrite a whole new 20,000 word ending. So I did that. And so now what the book is, it's sort of like a Frankenstein book. You've got this fully <laughs> fleshed out novel ending and it's this, but the beginning is sort of thinner. Mm-hmm. So I've had to go back and like, and this is actually a really effective way for me to rewrite because I'm looking at it like, oh, this is exactly where I wanted to land. This all, this resolves in a really satisfying way. Now, how do I go back to this thinner beginning and foreshadow and build to this? Mm. And so what's going to be funny is I have writers group tonight and they've read everything up to this point. Now they're going to read this fully fleshed out ending. <laughs> and I can, there, I can, I, in my comments, when I sent the submission, I said, listen, like this is, this is a fuller version of what you've read. Just stick with me here. Um, so I can just hear the comments like, wow, what what did we miss in the beginning? Because this is went in an entirely different direction. But I'd like to have a podcast a episode where we talk about or where you specifically, I'll interview you, talk about um, writing mystery and the process mm. of like, you know, the red herrings and the clues and the foreshadowing and, you know, how how do you craft that? And what's obligatory and what's, and I know you've got kind of a crush genre. So how does that affect it? And that would be really interesting. I like your SpongeBob been... mug, dude. <laughs> SpongeBob. My... That's funny. <laughs> I, my son, he got me this when I was, when he was three, I think. And all he, I think all he knew that about me at three years old was that I liked SpongeBob. So he took my wife to the to the store and just said like, that's for dad. So <laughs> I will funny. this. Yeah, this is my favorite mug. And it's like, look at the size of this thing. You can pretty much, you know, synchronize swim in it if you wanted to. <laughs> so um, it's a great morning mug. Nice. So yeah, mysteries. I'll put it like, I'll just, I'll, I'll foreshadow that episode. Like it's, <laughs> it is part, it's part accident and it's, it's part intent. Cause I really, I would love to know any, ever anyone who could, intentionally lay out all of those elements because like in sometimes the, in I just the think, plotting stage yeah i think sometimes you just have to sometimes i'll just write and say like oh this is clearly like a red herring um but i didn't mean it to be but it's just you know it mm-hmm. you kind of stumble into it and that for me that actually means more like to me like okay that that, that means it's going to work more for me than than if i plotted and, and it. I, like, I like too. a happy accident Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and then and then your process you said just a minute ago is that you go back and fill in and and do the foreshadowing and stuff afterwards that's i think what i'm gonna start doing (laughs) right i I stumbled into this process you know like i I, the book changed shape and then and dimension and so i ended up having to 
having to do that, but it's been so satisfying because I'm really like this week I've taken one chapter, which was three scenes and I've expanded it to three chapters and eight scenes, but I'm keeping those existing scenes. I'm just mm -hmm. adding things in right. that, you know, and that, that Flush is really, yeah, that fleshing it out part, which I've never really done before, uh, in this quite this way, I think I'm going to make this find a way to make this the process because you like it. The yeah. Yeah. I really do. Cool. To be continued. We'll talk about that more. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about failure. Let's talk about failure. So I want to start by saying that. I like how you said that with a laugh too, by the way, that was great. <laughs> Let's talk, failure. Let's giggle, talk but... about failure. You so so I really, thing. truly believe that failure is necessary to a person's success. Oh yeah. And I totally believe that in my head and not in my heart. So I still struggle every day to to believe that you know because I I tend to lean towards the oh but is it really do I have to fail I bet if I try harder and I stay focused and I do my research and and just get everything set it's going to be great and then the perfectionism starts getting in the way of starting and what I really really struggle to do and it's kind of a mantra for me now is to learn in public oh yeah that's a good way to that's yeah. what I'm trying to do because I want to normalize failure for myself <laughs> so I can stumble and do it in front of my audience and have it be okay. And, you know, ultimately I would like to have the rapport with my audience where I can do that, or I can start out by saying, Hey, I've never done this before, but let me try it. It sounds fun. Let's, yeah. let's do it together, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and how I, that can be a more fun journey than being so anxious about having everything look perfect and ready and professional and, and then start a project, you know, like a, like a service maybe that you want to provide or a course, like an online course, building an online course or something like that, or a webinar, like <laughs> I can just go in and yeah. learn in public and just give it a shot and see what happens. And that, that gets me started. What, what is that quote? Um, somebody brought it up to me just the other day, something, of, something is the failure. There's the, what is the, the opposite of done the fail or better the, quote. Yeah, there's no, not feel better, but the idea behind it is that if you, if you just keep worrying it and, and thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it, then it's never going to get done. Mm. Whatever it is that you started out doing, I'll have to find the quote, put it in the show notes. I've always liked the Beckett quote where, you know, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Like mm. I've always felt like. I think you're hitting on something that, uh, you know, I, yeah, I've always wrestled with and, and, and come to enjoy, like come to appreciate my relationship to failure. And that is, um, I mean, you can't, you can't plan your way to a hundred percent success. Like you can't, you, you're not genuinely trying anything new if that's what you're doing. That's my belief. So I feel like you have to accept that even the most polished professional anything is the product of failure, whether or not that creator chooses to fail in public or fail in private. If we hold those, those luminary authors and marketers and professionals and podcasters and all those things as the standard, like they just were hatched that way, then we like, that's an impossible standard to meet. I think it's just our choice and how we're going to, yeah, I've written a, the, the books that Mary had to choose from when she bought one. I've written a hundred books, started and failed 97 times. And that's fine. Like I wouldn't be here without failing it. You just have to accept that. Now I can hide that and just never fess to that to readers or, or in public, but why would I, you know, it's, it humanizes you to fail, I think. And that, that's what people want to connect with as a human being, not like a, a polished professional, that's you know, true. Yeah. thing they want to think we, we connect as, as you humans want to see the blood. In. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I the think blood. that's perfectly, I think the things that we're 
that we, you know, want to avoid the failures on is, wow, I just plunked down a hundred dollars on an ad campaign that went nowhere. I could have, I could have done more research. There's things like that, that I kick myself on. I invested a bunch of time and money into something that I could have researched just a little bit and done better. Those things I kick myself on because, but on the crafty side, on the, on the, on the, on the big business decision side, failure is part of it. Perfect is the enemy of done. That was the quote. There you go. Oh, I always say, I, I say a version of that. It's better is the enemy of good. Better. Like if you're always looking for something better, you're never mm. going to find something that's good enough. It's when we're looking for a restaurant on date night, I'll tell my wife, it's like, we're heading to one restaurant that we, that will either want to try or we've been to and she's looking for another one and i'll say like no 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 we, we're going to something good enough we there's nothing better than this right now um i think better. you can better yourself into par paralysis if you're not careful yeah so you said better is the enemy of good or the uh... that's yeah okay <laughs> but i always I, my, my eight-year-old can recite that off the, like he probably <laughs> shouted at some some person on the playground today so um, you were talking about um something i wanted to to circle back on. And actually, I remember during our coaching session on this show, uh -huh. um, you were talking about learning Amazon ads or like not wanting to, not wanting to um, look bad or feel not right. look bad because you're in your office by yourself, but like <laughs> you don't want to spend time doing something that you're bad at because it feels better to do I something hate... that you're good at. So always, right. We talked about playing in the sandbox and like blocking yeah. out time to, to just play around and that that was a, a mindset shift for some folks to be able to dip your toes into new things and be bad at them and fail at them because then it's not a, a matter of, you know, you're, it's kind of like writing a rough yeah. draft. Like it's not supposed to be good. <laughs> it's just, right. it's the crappy first draft. So Right. So play in the sandbox. I like, I liked that. I wondered how you did with that playing the sandbox. Did you have a, a positive, um, I did or experience on and off. with that? I, yeah. On and off I've, um, where I have struggled and I don't mind saying is like choosing, there's a number of things that I need a sandbox for, right? It's the, it's generally just marketing and advertising and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Um, it's the side of things that I have a lot of like desire to make work. Like I've probably plotted like 50 social media campaigns that I've never started. Mm -hmm. um, I've decided like where I have a hard time is where do I start? Like which one of these things to put in the priority? That's usually where I get paralyzed is like, I've got a, a newsletter that needs work. I've got a social media presence that needs work. And I've got an overall advertising presence that needs work which one do I focus on? And then I'll just like start writing a story again because I can't decide which one of those things to do. What I've chosen, how I've chosen to deal with this is to say like, which one of those things is the most important? Let's start with that one. And I started with the newsletter. So I am currently like reading, I'm reading five or six author newsletters a day. Um, some really great ones. I'm making a long, long list. I'm sort of figuring out how to do that same thing. Um, I'm working with a consultant on how to do the newsletter. Um, and this all sounds like I'm kind of inoculating myself from failure, but I'm just giving myself a better place to start. Yeah, I think and once that's a I, great idea. Yeah, and once I get this newsletter plan, I, I told the, I, I really want to just start of the year, be in a different newsletter place and be actively doing it, set it and forget it. I'll move on to the ads, partly because ads get really expensive this time of year and I'm not going to, fool around with ads when they're cost three times as much. Mm -hmm. But I'm also looking at a lot of the, the, the not Facebook pages, but Amazon pages for books that I am the also bots and, you know, just seeing how things better market copy. Wow. I've got a list of different, you know, how to write better book descriptions. And so, yeah, I think it's, I have to find that balance between, cause I'm an information gatherer. I have to be a better information executor to make that to really fulfill that sandbox promise you know to really dive into it but yeah so it it in increments i'm i am i am doing that because yeah. again it's easier to write 
it's easier to sit here and just come up with another story. As a number one input strength, um, the basement for that is like a constant inputting of data, research, getting lost in there, bringing in new classes, reading more stuff, and then not actually using it. <laughs> so I do yeah. get trapped in that uh, loop sometimes. What other and things it's, it's have you... Right? It, it is. It's, it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, what it's fun. I like to learn. What have you failed at in your writing career specifically? <laughs> you bring this up like personal. five to 10 minutes before the end rather than five to 10 minutes in. <laughs> um, well, I, you know, here's the biggest failure I've ever made. And it circles back to the beginning of our conversation where you said, hey, it's been a year since you've been on the podcast. It's like, I went into this author life probably when did we meet probably 10 years ago 10 or 12 years ago it's been oh, a long time yeah it's been more than 10 years yeah it's been it's been more than 10 years mm -hmm. um you were one of the few people that I made friends with and and felt like all right this is a connection I have in the author community there was a point in time where I just felt like all of this connection and community building I don't need it I'm a I'm above it and God, saying that out loud just makes my skin crawl because it's <laughs> so wrong. And where did I got that idea from? I don't know. Um, but I came to that realization probably eight or nine years ago where I thought, like, I saw all the people that I first uh, attended conferences with. Ben Gorman, who everybody in the Portland writing community knows. Like, I met him when he was just pitching a novel. And within two or three years, he was running Not a Pipe Press. And I thought, well, what's the difference here? Like, why is he why is he taking these steps? And I recognized because he was just making friends those first conference, and he those he kept those friends, and he was blossoming, growing that friend group. And so that's the biggest failure. I mean, I could ever attack. I say it all the time when people ask. Like, I just never thought I needed the community, and now I'm just that's all I want is just to be a part of one. What, My biggest what about you? Failures are diametrically opposed because <laughs> why wouldn't it be for me <laughs> so <laughs> what I mean by that is so I I really like planning as you know but I there often don't give the new plan enough time to work and I jump ship too fast you know, I'll, I'll be like, okay, this is going to be the new schedule and I'm going to do this and this on these days and I'm going to accomplish all this stuff and this is the way it will work. Or this is my new process. I'm going to do it this way. And I'll try it for like 10 days and think, well, that just doesn't work for me. <laughs> and I'll shift yeah. it and make up a new plan. <laughs> right. And I spend all this time like creating plans and then don't, don't allow enough time you know, for it to mature and to, to work or not, you know, so that's one side, but on the other side of that, I also get stuck doing things too long. For instance, one of my writing failures, I would say is stopping the writing and instead focusing on the nonfiction or the uh, the author services part. Like I remember designing this like coaching program and it took me like a year. I hired a business coach. I went through her program. I came up with my own signature program. And, you know, it took a long time because I created this awesome service, this awesome product, but but that whole year I wasn't writing new words. And then that didn't end up that, that, that was the, the launch day was supposed to happen. Like right as we all locked down for COVID. So that kind uh -huh. of fizzled out and didn't work and didn't go anywhere or, you know, so things like that, like I'll invest a bunch of time mostly and money too on doing this new thing. And it takes me away from the writing. So, right. right. So yeah, it's kind of the opposite of <laughs> I, I I have both sides of the both sides of the coin at the same time as failures. <laughs> I, yeah, and look, here's here's something I think what you said made me think and that is 
in this whole process of, if we just want to call it like the author life, I think that's just the, whatever you listener or you viewer want to make that, like whatever that is, I think there's going to be pinch points where failure is abundant. You know, when I first went freelance 10, 10 years ago, like I could, there was a cascade, there was a waterfall of failure right around there. Cause I would have done it all differently if I could have within a month, I knew like, okay, I would have done it differently. Like my benchmark for leaving would have been different than the one I set out for myself. I just think there's these points and then you get into a flow. And like right now I could say like my failures are small um, because I'm in a flow. When I choose to do something new, right? I'm going to start this Patreon thing in about six weeks. That probably will be met with a few more failures and a few more <laughs> failures in public. So I think you just have to recognize that there's just different times and different like failures more abundant at certain times than at others. But I think the the thing to note is the writing itself, you can't look at it as you, you can start a story you don't finish, but I don't think you can look at that as a failure. I think there's there's books that are failed, stories that are failed. And I think you can look at them a, a myriad of ways. But if you if you look at the energy you put into starting them and writing them and trying to make them work as failure, then you're not going to grow in this. Really. Um, That's so true. You have to fail in order to grow. It's part of the part of the process. Yeah. And I don't, the idea that like, I think there's a lot of people out there who are, who are not holding themselves to a high writing standard. I'll just say that I'm not saying there's a lot of, there's bad writers. I'm just saying there's people out there who are publishing everything they write and mark and, and trying to put it into that. It's okay to have a drawer of books that like, yeah, this one didn't work. It's great. In fact, I think going back to that old literary standard of having that drawer of dirty, old, dirty little secrets <laughs> is a good one. Like just, I've got a, I, I've got a novel that boy, before I die, the instructions are to burn it. Just get rid of it. All evidence of it. It's so embarrassing to me. Um, I don't have I those have on physical have copies. They're all on like old computer hard drives that don't work anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll be lost. Nobody will. If my them. child is really like mad at me at that time, he might go, you know, bring it out and, and publish it with my name on it. He wouldn't do that. I hope. Um, <laughs> But I think you have to have those things. So you just have to, you if you can write a novel the first time and nail it, you're a wizard of some kind. You're, who are you? I don't know. You're a you wizard, are. Harry. You're a wizard. <laughs> oh, he just passed away. He did? Haggard? Yeah, isn't that Robbie? Yeah, Robbie Coltrane. He died like a couple months ago. Oh. Oh, no. We're going to end this on a real bum note. <laughs> the actor that played Haggard passed away. Like. I think in September. Hmm. Oh no. I wonder if I saw that and just sort of put it out of my memory. I remember one time my ex-husband went dressed up as Hagrid for Halloween. It was awesome. It was really rad. He had this big cloak and he bought these like platform boots. So he was, he's already six, five. So then he put the platform boots on. So he was, you know, really tall. And my, uh, my, right. uh, oldest child had a, a pink umbrella at the time so he carried that around yeah he was a great Hagrid that was an awesome mm, Halloween costume such a great character yeah hard to read out loud when you're reading those books out loud to your kids trying to get into the Hagrid dialogue can be really slow you yeah, down it was a dialect that you have to skim and just sort of absorb and know what he's saying <laughs> I just half of it I was just like I kind of read ahead with my eye and just uh -huh. like was winging it like all right it's in there. That's a, you know, small I failure. Just, <laughs> I can't do yeah. the Hagrid dialect. <laughs> yeah, I can't do Hagrid. Small failure. Just fail better, folks. That's the key, right? Fail just better. Keep writing it. If it if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and it might just be the story. You know, it's the, you know, if you want to analyze it, then just be good to yourself. Maybe it's not the execution, the actual writing of it. Maybe the story just wasn't there. Yeah. Maybe it, there wasn't enough. And and this really is a mindset shift for some people. Like it is a oh yeah, the the fail. If you fail at something, that doesn't mean that you are a failure. It just means right that didn't work, and let's learn from it. Which sounds right. contrite, but you know. <laughs> I actually was a. I was doing a. I'm doing a beta read for a friend of mine who's a, a computer programmer. Was a computer programmer, and 
one of the things he said really early on was like, I've always wanted to write a novel because it's kind of the opposite of writing code and things. It's like you, you get to trial and error it. You get to like, you know, rewrite it mm. and rewrite it and fail it and fail it. It's a different, whole different process of like the, even a finished book isn't perfect. You still get things that people don't like, you know, they'll, I'm sure in Mexican Gothic, if I love it, there's going to be something in it that I say, I didn't like this part or you can't be. Yeah. And, and I really do like that. Perfect is the enemy of done. And because I remember I very smartly, I think, you know, you make the, the book be as, as perfect as you can make it. And my first book, my first novel, the scent of apple tea, when I, went to publish it I did get some feedback from my writers group saying you know it's just not quite there yet and I feel like the character motivation is not quite there and I thought you know what this is my very first novel like I know I'm going to grow as a writer and if I try to rework this book again like it's just going to delay and maybe I'll make it five percent better but perfect as the enemy have done. So let's just put it out there. It's my first novel. I'll get better with the next one. And so I was really proud of myself for, for making that call. Now I just need to yeah. keep doing it. <laughs> I think of, I mean, if I can put a sort of a button on this conversation is I wish I would have started failing earlier when it comes to the writing oh, side I of it. Like, like I, re- I want to put I that really on a wish, t-shirt. I wish. I really wish I would have well, it was my goal when I went freelance. I thought, okay, like I kind of just did the math. I'm making as much sort of moonlighting as a as a ghostwriter than I was as a caseworker. So I decided, okay, I'll just go work four hours a day as a ghostwriter. And then I'd have four hours a day to write my stuff. And then I spent five years not writing books that I wanted to write because mm. I don't know, because I was maybe afraid of failure, maybe afraid of defining what boat. I was doing mm-hmm. yeah and actually it was my kid who said like it's the whole apple story I've probably the told apple it a, story, a bunch yeah. of times and and that was when I thought like no you can't you're not just you, you're not just doing apples down there you're not just eating apples you're actually doing something and you have to show something for it because that's the example you know you're you're doing it what are you doing you, you you have to just do it in public if you can't you can't hide it forever yeah. so for sure. Well, I feel better. And then five years later, the book's out there for Mary to buy, and here we are. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. <laughs> oh well, next week we are going to uh, be talking about. This is timely <laughs> for me because um, it is how to decide on your next project. Oh, I love this topic. Love it. Yeah, I have lots. And I'll have of my cake for my it. one year anniversary. My cake will have shown oh. up, and we'll <laughs> put the one candle in it. <laughs> yes, if you want to wish Eric a happy anniversary, leave us a message. And I'll we'll read it out yeah, on the podcast. Please do. All right. So next episode, how to decide on your next project, and um, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks see for you talking next week. With me. Happy writing, everybody. Happy writing. Happy failing. Yeah. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye.